Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter in Washington. Today is February 28, 1979, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 43. All across the United States millions of Americans are growing weary of a long, harsh winter. Over large areas of the country the winter storms this year have been abnormal and unpredictable. Time and again America's industrial heartland in the Midwest has been paralyzed by unusually heavy snowstorms. Powerful rainstorms have battered California, which supplies a major share of America's food supply. The major population corridors of the Northeast have endured storm after storm, taxing energy supplies and human patience. In the Southwest and elsewhere, storms have caused losses of electrical power on an unprecedented scale, and even here in Washington, D.C., the biggest snowstorm in over 50 years has just taken place. For days the nation's capital was brought to a standstill by two feet of snow, and we are still digging out. And strange weather patterns have struck also in Europe this winter. Four weeks ago on January 31 NATO ground forces gathered in Germany for their first winter maneuvers in six years. When they began conditions appeared ideal. The ground was frozen solid to the depth of five inches, making a nice firm footing for NATO tanks and other vehicles. There was also a convenient amount of snow on the ground, a little less than a foot. This was enough to make the war game seem realistic without actually making things difficult. The NATO teams were divided up into mock invaders called the Orange Force and defenders called the Blue Force. At one minute after midnight January 31 the Orange Force began its make-believe invasion. It was right on schedule without the element of surprise that would exist in a real invasion. Even so, the attacking Orange Force soon outflanked the Blue Defenders, and for the next two days the Orange Force, representing the Warsaw Pact, rode southward across the West German landscape. Meanwhile, the so-called Blue Force, representing NATO defenders, were getting set to counterattack. On the morning of February 2, the third day of the make-believe war, the Blue Force was almost ready to go, but then the unexpected happened. Suddenly the weather changed. Strong warm winds blew up out of nowhere, and soon these were joined by rain. Within hours the ideal maneuvering conditions vanished. The snow melted, swelling streams and causing local flooding, and the frost melted, causing the whole area to turn into a mud bog. Tanks churned and groaned as they sank into the mire. Meanwhile NATO's alleged new wonder weapon against enemy tanks, the A-10 close support aircraft, turned out to be absolutely useless. They were grounded by dense fog. Flooding caused a rush evacuation of a field hospital, and for three days NATO troops, tanks, and artillery sat stalled in a so-called administrative hold." Quote, unquote. Finally NATO Commander General Alexander Haig flew over the scene by helicopter and then called off the whole thing. And so the NATO exercise, which had been named Certain Sentinel, ended on a very uncertain note. Meanwhile, 200 miles away in Czechoslovakia, Warsaw Pact maneuvers were underway too, and when the weather changed they went on as if nothing had happened. It's almost as if the weather itself had turned against the United States and the NATO alliance, and, my friend, it has. Over a year ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 29 I revealed that Russia had begun the operational deployment of hovering weapons platforms. These remarkable machines, which the Russians call Cosmospheres, are armed with charged particle beam weapons. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 29 seven Cosmospheres were on station over the continental United States, and they were causing the famous air blasts now called airquakes. These were the byproduct of weather modification experiments using their beam weapons in a defocused mode. Fourteen years ago the late General Thomas Power, former commander of the United States Strategic Air Command, gave a public warning in advance about these hovering military craft. 
In AUDIO LETTER No. 32 I REVIEW GENERAL POWER'S EFFORTS TO WARN AMERICA BEFORE IT WAS TOO LATE, BUT HE WAS IGNORED, AND RUSSIA DEVELOPED THESE MACHINES WHILE AMERICA DID NOT. AND TODAY THEY ARE ON STATION OVER OUR MISSILE BASES, MAJOR DAMS AND CITIES, READY TO PULVERIZE TARGETS ON COMMAND. THEY ARE ALSO MANIPULATING THE WEATHER OVER THE UNITED STATES. AND A SQUADRON OF COSMOSPHERES USED THE WEATHER TO TURN NATO'S SO-CALLED CERT AND SENTINEL MANEUVERS INTO A FARCE. THE PURPOSE WAS A BLOODLESS OBJECT LESSON TO THE WESTERN EUROPEAN MEMBERS OF NATO. THE KREMLIN IS TRYING BY EVERY POSSIBLE MEANS TO PERSUADE WESTERN EUROPE TO STAY OUT OF THE COMING THERMONUCLEAR WAR BETWEEN RUSSIA AND AMERICA. But most Americans still are blissfully unaware of the reason for much of this winter is unusual weather. All they know is that they are tired of winter and looking forward to the first signs of spring. And yet, my friends, if the new Bolsheviks who now control the American Government have their way, the season of real trial and hardship is only beginning, not ending. Their intrigues are accelerating toward a climax. And as winter melts away, the world is heating up with the danger of war. Six months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 I revealed in detail the top secret plans of America's rulers to initiate nuclear war with Russia. For the first time in American history it is now the master strategy of the United States to strike first in a major war. And in this same AUDIO LETTER I outlined the steps which were being planned to lead up to full-scale war with Russia. The strategy of the new Bolsheviks to launch an American nuclear first strike against Russia is already far advanced and moving fast. Many elements of the top secret plan which I revealed last August have already become highly visible. First, the Camp David summit of last September 1978 set the plan in motion. The plan I had revealed was followed to the letter and the so-called Surprise Peace Accords were signed with big smiles by Carter, Begin, and Sadat on nationwide television. Likewise, the Bolshevik plan to throw the Roman Catholic Church into their own fight against Russia has been moving along right on track. Pope John Paul I, elected only the day before our recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 37, quickly left the scene, and today the anti-Russian policies of the Vatican are becoming more visible by the day. More recently, the crucial importance of Iran and China in the first strike plan has caused them both to dominate the news. As planned six months ago, Iran has been made a source of concern to the American public, and China, whose western province of Sinkiang is essential to the American first strike strategy, forced the United States into full diplomatic recognition over two months ago. Now we are moving rapidly toward the stage of oil shortages and gas rationing as the crisis atmosphere intensifies prior to war. And exactly according to plan, Saudi Arabia is being painted more and more as a threat to peace by politicians and the controlled major media. My friends, springtime is always a time of unrest and possible war. It is the easiest time of the year to trigger violence, and as spring approaches, preparations are underway jointly by the United States and Israeli governments to trigger an incident that will cause war to erupt in the Middle East. The nuclear destruction of Saudi Arabia's oil fields is intended to follow soon afterward. In Eastern Europe, too, the coming of spring is accompanied by great danger this year. Last month I revealed the Bolshevik plan for the Pope's revolution quote unquote, to erupt in Krakow, Poland this May. The key to the plan is to be the visit to Poland in May by the actor Pope, the man who calls himself Pope John Paul II. And just six days ago it was revealed that the Pope now plans to be in Poland May 13 through the 15th. For the reasons I revealed last month, my friends, it will be the beginning of the end for the West if the Pope's revolution does take place. That means the next two months or so could well determine the future course of human history. If that history is written according to the Satanic Bolshevik plan, 
It will be written in our blood, and it will be a story of thermonuclear catastrophe, unparalleled destruction, tragedy, suffering, torment, all on a scale that is beyond human comprehension. And yet, my friends, I must remind you once again of something I pointed out in my very first talking tape recorded over four years ago in October 1974. That was AUDIO BOOK No. 1, titled How to Protect Yourself During the Coming Depression and Third World War. The information I make public from my own intelligence concerns the plans of men. These human plans are not unchangeable. The men who make these plans like to play God, but they are not gods. Their plans do change. Their timetables do slip. They do make mistakes, and the unexpected does happen. During the past several weeks, my friends, the unexpected has happened. Dramatic events have taken place, hidden from the public, which will inevitably have profound effects on the course of events, both here and worldwide. My three topics for this month are Topic No. 1, the mysterious disappearance of Dr. Henry Kissinger. Topic No. 2, the plundering of the Rockefeller family empire. And Topic No. 3, our last chance to save Western civilization. Topic No. 1. Last month, on the evening of January 26, the life of Nelson Rockefeller suddenly came to an end. Five days later, when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 42, I was able to report that he had been murdered by a single expert shot to the head. Immediately Rockefeller aides and spokesmen were put to work in a feverish effort to cover up what had happened. For the reasons I mentioned last month, Nelson's surviving brothers, David and Lawrence, felt that it would be too dangerous to have the public know he had been murdered. It would have raised too many questions. And so Rockefeller spokesmen spouted one set of lies after another for public consumption. Meanwhile, Nelson Rockefeller's body was cremated quickly to make sure that the multiplying public questions about his death did not lead to an autopsy. By the time I record AUDIO LETTER No. 42 on January 31, key Rockefeller family spokesman Hugh Morrow had run through three versions of the circumstances surrounding Rockefeller's death and each new version demolished what he had already said. About a week later the third version began falling apart. News reports quoting unnamed sources within the Rockefeller family said that the person who had called the New York Emergency No. 911 for an ambulance was not Megan Marshak. Miss Marshak, Rockefeller's young aide, had been with him in his townhouse at the time of death. But the 911 call, it was now said, have been made by Miss Ponchita Pierce. Miss Pierce, a New York television personality, was said to be a friend and neighbor of Marshak. On Saturday night, February 10, Ponchita Pierce put an end to several days of questions and rumors by releasing a statement through her attorney. But her statement triggered new questions as it ruined all previous statements by Rockefeller spokesmen about Rockefeller's death. In her statement, Ponchita Pierce said that Megan Marshak had called her between 10.50 and 11 p.m. on that evening of January 26. That ruined the official story of Rockefeller's spokesman to the effect that Rockefeller had suffered his heart attack, quote-unquote, at 11.15 p.m., and it revived the early questions to the effect, why all the delays between Rockefeller's alleged heart attack and a call for help? The Pierce statement added to the mystery in another way, too. She said that she got to Rockefeller's townhouse at about 11.15, called the 911 emergency number to request an ambulance, and then left quickly to go back to her own apartment. The natural question is, why would anyone flee from the scene of a heart attack? Especially since, contrary to some reports, Ponchita Pierce had known Nelson Rockefeller for more than ten years. Why didn't she stay to help unless he was obviously beyond help? On the same day that Ponchita Pierce released her statement to the press, the New York Post quoted Stephen Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller's second eldest son, as calling for clarification of the whole situation. And two days later his son Stephen, Jr., 
Nelson Rockefeller's 18-year-old grandson reportedly said, quote, We just want the truth. The issue is simply whether he could be alive now. Had he been a more practical man, thorough in his bodyguard protection, maybe this would not have happened." Unquote. These words of Nelson Rockefeller's grandson, Stephen, Jr., were dangerously close to the mark. Last month I explained how Nelson Rockefeller had been caught in a weak moment with his guard down and with his normal large contingent of bodyguards off duty. Two days later, February 14, his father Stephen made a complete turnabout. He joined with his brother Rodman and sisters Anne and Mary in a joint statement aimed at cutting off the controversy. The statement said in part, quote, Since we are convinced that nothing could be done to save Father, and that all the people who tried to help acted responsibly, we feel that it is wrong for us to take part in a continued debate over the details. Consequently, we do not intend to make any further public comment." Unquote. But the circumstances surrounding the death of Nelson Rockefeller have an important bearing on the future of the United States, not just the future of the Rockefeller family. So the questions about those circumstances will not go away just by wishing it so. As a footnote to what I made public last month, I can now reveal the reason for the long delay between Rockefeller's shooting and the 11.16 p.m. call for an ambulance. Rockefeller did not die at 11.15 p.m., nor even at 10.15 p.m., as stated in the earliest news reports. The death actually took place between 9.30 and 10 p.m. After Megan Marshak recovered from her semi-state of shock following the shooting, she placed a call which still has not been made public. As a result of this call, a doctor quickly arrived who was prepared to handle the situation. The single gunshot wound in Rockefeller's forehead stopped bleeding in less than an hour. The doctor then filled the bullet hole with calomine lotion, which hardened. After cleaning off all the blood, the doctor's job was done. It would now be possible to remove the body by ambulance without the true cause of death being apparent at a glance to casual bystanders. The doctor's makeshift work on the scene did fool bystanders. But if you will look on page 39 of Look Magazine for March 5, 1979, you will discover that the job was not quite perfect. The photo at the bottom of the page is of Nelson Rockefeller's body as it was being carried out of his townhouse on a stretcher. The picture is grainy and shows little detail. Even so, look closely. One to two inches above the bridge of the nose and slightly toward the left eyebrow you will see a roughly circular dark area. That, my friends, is the hastily disguised bullet hole. The calamine lotion did not completely hide the discoloration and was not smooth to perfection. Last month I alerted my listeners to the fact that the man who stood to gain the most from Nelson Rockefeller's death was his protege of 25 years, Henry Kissinger. And Kissinger wasted no time in pushing ahead with his bid to fill Nelson Rockefeller's shoes in the inner family circle of the Rockefeller Empire. His campaign was already well underway on Friday, February 2, 1979. On that day a memorial service for Nelson Rockefeller at the Riverside Church in New York was attended by well over 2,000 people from 71 nations. Eulogies were delivered by a daughter, Anne Rockefeller Roberts by a son, Rodman C. Rockefeller, and by brother, David Rockefeller, and by Henry Kissinger. It was Kissinger whose eulogy received all the attention from the controlled major media, and no wonder. The huge audience was hushed as Henry Kissinger made his way to the pulpit. Then, seemingly with tears in his eyes, Kissinger began to speak of Nelson Rockefeller. As his choking voice echoed through the great sanctuary of the Riverside Church, Kissinger referred to Rockefeller as friend, inspiration, teacher, and, quote, my older brother, unquote. Kissinger's eulogy was a masterpiece and brought tears to the eyes of many. The final passage was about sitting with Nelson Rockefeller, quote, on the veranda overlooking his beloved Hudson River 
in the setting sun." Unquote. And as the last words of the eulogy, Kissinger claimed that Rockefeller would occasionally say, quote, Never forget that the most profound force in the world is love." Unquote. With those final words echoing through the church, the man who had plotted the death of Nelson Rockefeller turned and slowly left the pulpit. What Kissinger did not suspect was that he had just said his final words in public. The following evening, Saturday, February 3, Kissinger was reportedly in Seattle with the stated intention of seeing China's Dong Xiaoping. In fact, the Washington Post two days later reported that Kissinger saw Dong in Seattle on Sunday morning, February 4, but the Post was wrong about that. At about the same time that the Washington Post said Kissinger was in Seattle, he was actually at Dulles Airport outside Washington, D.C. Just past noon at 12.30 p.m. Washington time, February 4, Kissinger took off for London on the British Airways Concord. Less than 11 hours later, Kissinger arrived at Chaumont in the Wadre Valley, France, where it was the morning of February 5. From there Kissinger flew nearly 200 miles west to Blois, France in time to breakfast there. By late that evening of February 5, Henry Kissinger and his wife Nancy were in London. At approximately 11 p.m. London time they took off for the United States in a private jet, and as they did so they were subject to continuous surveillance. A network of 26 Russian Cosmospheres were on station at that time above the air lanes between America's east coast and Europe. At 7.12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 5, all contact with the jet carrying Henry and Nancy Kissinger was abruptly lost. The jet did not arrive at its destination, and Henry and Nancy Kissinger are nowhere to be found. Kissinger aides claim that he is on vacation, quote, unquote. Meanwhile, articles keep being printed about Kissinger which keep his name before the public, but he himself has dropped out of sight. On February 15 I stated publicly that Kissinger was missing on the Ray Bream talk show over radio station KABC Los Angeles. And on February 17 I appeared on the Bob Snyder talk show over radio station WING Tampa, Florida. On that program I not only reported that Kissinger was missing, but stated that he had been so since February 5. I also gave Kissinger's itinerary immediately preceding his disappearance, that is, Washington to London to France to London again, and then missing. Now there is already an attempt to head off public awareness that Kissinger is missing. His aides are now giving out a cover story which has already found its way into print. In the New York Daily News for February 26, just two days ago, the People section contained an item titled, K. Soothed Sorrow in Europe." Unquote. It began, quote, Where is Henry Kissinger hiding? Unquote. Saying that an unnamed Washington commentator suggested he was missing, the article says, quote, Well, forget it all. The fact is Henry and his wife Nancy left town shortly after the death of his close friend. Nelson Rockefeller for a vacation from the news hounds. Henry left New York February 4, went to England, then France, back to London, and is now in Mexico." Unquote. As I mentioned before, Kissinger left Washington on February 4, not New York, and his plane did not land in Mexico or anywhere else after leaving London on February 5. But the New York Daily News article says Kissinger is expected back next month, and just for good measure, a Kissinger aide is quoted as saying, He is alive and well and may show up anywhere in the world because he is welcome anywhere." Unquote. My friends, I can only say that it will be a miracle if the real Henry Kissinger is ever seen again. And speaking as a lawyer, I can tell you that only the real Henry Kissinger could bring legal action against me for what I have told you concerning his criminal activities against the life of Nelson Rockefeller. Henry Kissinger has vanished from the scene just as he was on the threshold of the ultimate grab for power that was his dream. But Kissinger conspired with others 
to bring about far more than the mere death of Nelson Rockefeller, and the startling events he helped to set in motion have continued despite his own mysterious disappearance. Topic No. 2 On February 7, two days after the disappearance of the Kissinger jet over the North Atlantic, Megan Marshak emerged out of hiding. She was seen briefly in New York and was photographed wearing a raccoon coat. That was the last time she was seen in public. That night she and David Rockefeller boarded one of David Rockefeller's private jets and took off for London. Arriving in London the morning of February 8, local time, they headed for separate destinations. She went to a location in the western end of London while he had business in the Seven Oaks section of South London. Early the following morning David Rockefeller received an urgent message to go to Megan's location in the west end of London. There had been some trouble. Arriving there he saw for himself Megan Ruth Marshak, the only known witness to the actual murder of Nelson Rockefeller, was dead. She had died as Rockefeller had, with a single bullet in the forehead. Megan Marshak was far less well known in England than she had become here in America, but the psychological profile of David Rockefeller would show that his reaction in this new crisis would be much the same as it had been when his brother had been murdered. David Rockefeller would insist upon overseeing arrangements to make sure that the public did not learn that Megan Marshak had been shot to death. And so he stayed on the scene just long enough to become a target himself. Within a few hours the body of Megan Marshak was on its way to a morgue in northeast London without identification of any kind. But then David Rockefeller died in the same way, a single bullet to the head. Early that afternoon, February 9, David Rockefeller's body was placed aboard the private jet that had brought him and Megan Marshak to London the previous day. The jet took off for the United States. Just as the Kissinger jet had done four days earlier, it was running a gauntlet of surveillance by Russian cosmospheres, and apparently the Russians did not know that David Rockefeller was already dead as his jet streaked westward across the North Atlantic. At a point within 100 miles of the last known location of the Kissinger jet, all contact was abruptly lost with the jet carrying David Rockefeller's body, and the jet never arrived at its destination. On Sunday morning, February 11, Ponchita Pierce was seen on her television program by viewers of New York's Channel 4, WNBC, but the program was on tape as usual. Ponchita Pierce herself was nowhere to be found. The previous evening she had released her statement to the press about her actions on the evening of Nelson Rockefeller's death and had raised all sorts of new questions in the process, and since that time Ponchita Pierce has been missing. Meanwhile her television program is going on each week just as usual. She is said to have already taped programs until sometime in May. When questioned, her office has been saying lately that she is on vacation, quote, unquote. The same thing is now being said of Megan Marshak at her office, on vacation, quote, unquote. On the evening of February 13, the body of Hugh Morrow, the longtime Rockefeller family spokesman, was discovered. Following the death of Nelson Rockefeller, it was Morrow who was given the heaviest responsibility for carrying out the cover-up campaign. Now the death of Morrow himself is a subject of cover-up efforts. Morrow died of a bullet between the eyes on February 13, and that is the real reason why we are hearing no new pronouncements from him these days. But his office claims that he is, quote, on vacation, unquote. Early Saturday morning, February 17, the third generation of the Rockefeller dynasty came to an end. Lawrence Rockefeller died in the same manner as Pope John Paul I did last October, of a bullet to the nape of the neck. And the next morning both Lawrence Rockefeller and Hugh Morrow were cremated. In my appearance of February 15 on the Ray Bream radio show in Los Angeles, I mentioned all of these missing persons, except for Lawrence Rockefeller, who was still alive then, 
Two days later, on the Bob Snyder Show in Tampa, Florida, I listed them all and stated how long each had been missing. And according to the New York Post for February 15, 1979, it was claimed that Rockefeller Security aides Andy Hoffman and William Keogh, as well as chauffeur Lonnie Wilshire, cannot be found. My friends, according to high intelligence, what has just taken place is nothing less than a bloody coup d'etat involving the real rulers of America. And those responsible are none other than those former allies of the Rockefellers, the new Bolsheviks. Now the plundering of the Rockefeller family fortune is beginning, without the Rockefeller fourth generation suspecting a thing. After all, as I have always made clear in the past, the fourth generation Rockefellers were not party to the machinations of the four brothers. As a result, they are not aware of the true implications of the recent upheavals that have wiped out the third generation brothers, and they are being duped into public silence about these chilling events in the mistaken belief that silence is in their own best interest. The fact is that their silence is playing into the hands of those who want to loot the Rockefellers of their wealth, and it is also serving the interests of those who are working feverishly to throw the United States into the fires of dictatorship and war, the new Bolsheviks. During the recent past, the four Rockefeller brothers made one final great mistake that has now cost them their lives. That mistake was brought on by panic over a year and a half ago. In a stunning upset on September 27, 1977, the United States was defeated by Russia in the most decisive battle of the 20th century. It was the still secret battle of the Harvest Moon in space, history's first true space battle. In a single blow, the Russians had undone the Machiavellian Rockefeller two-pronged strategy for world domination, and now it was Russia that was suddenly calling the shots. The Rockefeller brothers knew they were in deep, deep trouble. In a state of near panic, the four Rockefeller brothers began casting about for a way to stave off Russia, and that is when they made their final fatal mistake. Certain of their advisors reminded them that the Rockefeller-Soviet alliance was not really with Russia itself, but with the Bolsheviks in Russia. The new Russian regime had already begun weeding out and expelling the old Bolsheviks from Russia. The advisers argued that since they were the real allies of the Rockefellers, and since they knew Russia, the old Bolsheviks should be welcomed to America and placed rapidly in positions of power. In their panicky need to do something fast, the Rockefeller brothers accepted this line of reasoning but in doing so they were forgetting the true nature of their alliance with the Bolsheviks. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 7 in December 1975, over three years ago, the long-standing secret Rockefeller-Soviet alliance was still functioning. In that AUDIO LETTER I explained the nature of the alliance. It was an alliance between corporate socialists on one hand, the Rockefellers, and the state socialists on the other, the rulers of the Soviet Union. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 7, corporate socialism and state socialism are two sides of the same coin. Both are systems for amassing great wealth and power into the hands of only a few people. So an alliance between the rulers of two separate countries having these two systems is natural. But what the Rockefellers forgot, their fatal mistake, is that corporate socialism and state socialism cannot coexist in the same society. Corporate Socialism has as its goal giant monopolies that are completely exempt from governmental regulation. State Socialism seeks the exact opposite, that is, total governmental control and regulation of everything and everyone. To bring them together under the same roof is to guarantee a head-on collision between the two. And that, my friends, is what is beginning to happen now. It was in AUDIO LETTER No. 29 for December 1977 that I was first able to reveal that a new Bolshevik Revolution was getting underway here in the United States with the aid of the Rockefeller Brothers. By the time I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 38 last September, the handwriting was already on the wall for the four Rockefeller Brothers. Already the oldest of the brothers, John D. III, had suddenly vanished from the scene 
and in AUDIO LETTER No. 38 I pointed out that, quote, Increasingly it is not the Rockefeller Brothers who are using the Bolsheviks, but the other way around. Soon the remaining three Rockefeller Brothers will fade from the scene, but that will not undo the cancer of Bolshevism with which they have infected the West. End of quotation from AUDIO LETTER No. 38. The kingpin among the new Bolsheviks in America was to be Henry Kissinger. He was Nelson Rockefeller's protege for 25 years, but he played both sides of every street. With his easy access to the plans, the personnel, and the resources of the Rockefeller Empire, Kissinger was the most important single person among the new Bolshevik faction in America. Kissinger truly believed that he could replace Nelson Rockefeller and someday become President of the world. My friends, the known witness to Nelson Rockefeller's death, Megan Marshak, as well as others close to that case, have vanished from the scene. The entire pattern of events, except for Kissinger's disappearance, is typical of Bolshevik purges which always include measures to cover their tracks. The new Bolsheviks are now in control of America through their grip on the United States Government, but it still remains for them to spread and consolidate their power base. And to this end they will perpetuate the fiction as long as possible that David Rockefeller, Lawrence Rockefeller, and Henry and Nancy Kissinger are still alive. In this way actions can be taken in the name of these other people that would not be possible if they were known to be dead. Surviving members of the Rockefeller family have been led to believe that their own security, even their physical security, depends upon their maintaining silence about the events of recent days. But the truth is that their silence is being used against them. Unlike the late four brothers, the fourth-generation Rockefellers do not wield great influence over the far-flung Rockefeller cartel of banks multinational corporations, foundations, and so on. They are largely at the mercy of managers of all these assets. By their silence they are leaving many of these managers with the power to plunder the collapsing Rockefeller empire of its riches. To preserve their power governmentally and otherwise, it is crucial right now that the Bolsheviks suppress any news of the disappearances I have told you about. Therefore doubles or look-alikes may begin to appear on the scene for these people. What is amazing, especially in the case of Kissinger, is that they have been able to stifle public questions for so long in his absence. But the Bolsheviks know that doubles fool only the public. An intimate friend of David Rockefeller, for example, would not be deceived for long in a face-to-face -face meeting, and so doubles would be used only as a last resort. My friends, with the four Rockefeller brothers out of the picture and with Henry Kissinger gone, a new ad hoc gang of four has emerged who are now in control of the United States Government. These four are Zbigniew Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's National Security Advisor. In 1973 Brzezinski did the legwork for David Rockefeller in organizing the Trilateral Commission. Like the late Henry Kissinger, he is foreign-born. W. Michael Blumenthal, Secretary of the Treasury, Trilateral Commission member and foreign-born. As a former head of Bendix Corporation, Blumenthal has important ties to the Rockefeller corporate aristocracy. This is particularly true in the area of arms and defense, which is the real topic of his present trip to Red China. Harold Brown, Secretary of Defense. Trilateral Commission member, and James Schlesinger, Secretary of Energy. Schlesinger is not an official member of the Trilateral Commission, but he is of like mind with the others. His approach is control from the top and heavy governmental regulation of everything. Schlesinger formerly headed the Atomic Energy Commission, the CIA, and the Department of Defense. One common thread that runs through the background of all these men is their preoccupation with matters of warfare, weaponry, and international maneuvering. In every possible way they are all trying to hurry along the Bolshevik strategy 
for a nuclear first strike against Russia. My friends, all of them are very dangerous men. But the new gang of four cannot truly replace the four Rockefeller brothers. For the first time ever, these men no longer have anyone to give them instructions and pave their way. They are trying to carry out the very detailed plans which have already been set in motion, but they are doing it without the same power base which the four Rockefeller brothers had at their disposal. And so the question is, can they be stopped? Topic No. 3. Over 100 years ago the United States of America began falling under the spell of Rockefeller power. Slowly at first, but then faster and faster, John D. Rockefeller, Sr. moved to the head of the line of America's robber barons. As the 19th century was on the wane, the Rockefellers were forming alliances with other powerful groups, not only here in America, but overseas. Through their influence on America's leaders, they began turning the United States away from the virtues extolled by George Washington and toward the vicious ways of Machiavelli. More than 80 years ago the Spanish-American War broke out as a shadow of things to come. The war was brought about by the United States, not Spain, yet most Americans were lured into supporting America's acts of shame. America began to trade national honor for prestige as a world power. In this way the stage was being set for the 20th century. It was to be the century of oil politics, of war after war, each worse than the one before, an ever-expanding Rockefeller power. In all of this the United States of America was to be no more than a springboard in the Rockefeller plan to finally control the whole world. And so as Rockefeller power became ever more complete in America, our country's behavior became increasingly foreign to our own traditions and values. As a nation we began to court our enemies while punishing our friends. The land of opportunity gradually was twisted into the land of regulations, and the original American concept that all men are equal in the sight of the law was gradually warped into the idea that all human beings have to be the same in all respects. Our value as individuals began fading from our own minds so that we might be molded more perfectly into a society of perfect slaves. Down through the years millions of Americans have been alert enough to feel at least vaguely that something was wrong, but the real source and reason for all these disturbing trends was always kept hidden and so there was no one to challenge or hinder the master program of Rockefeller conquest. In recent years America's drift toward nuclear war has also been more and more apparent, but here too Americans sat paralyzed as the Rockefeller planters dragged us closer and closer to the fire. For decades now most Americans have fallen into one of two groups. By far the larger group has consisted of that great silent majority, so-called. They have been silent about Rockefeller power and intrigue because they did not know about it. The other main group, much smaller, has consisted of those who did know about Rockefeller power and felt it was too great to be challenged. Down through the years only scattered individuals have both known the truth and dared to actively oppose what was happening to America. And those few, my friends, have always been easy to isolate and neutralize in various ways. But now for the first time in a century the situation has changed. Almost overnight the centralized control of the worldwide power of the Rockefeller Empire has been shattered. The four Rockefeller brothers of the third generation are no more, and there is no one who can really fill their shoes. But the new gang of four, Brzezinski, Brown, Blumenthal, and Schlesinger, are eager to set themselves up as our undisputed rulers. Left to themselves, they will lead America into thermonuclear national suicide. But their dreams of replacing the four Rockefeller brothers are insane. What will they do, my friends, when it becomes known in the corridors of power worldwide? that David Rockefeller is no more. Who will hold the intimate private dinner gatherings with the powerful here and abroad by which David Rockefeller kept everyone on the same track? 
Who will take his place, giving word from on high on big policy shifts? Who will keep the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Council of the Americas humming along in unison as he did? Who will coordinate the actions of the top 200 industrial corporations and banks of the world as he did? Who will guide the policies of the Business Council or of the Business Roundtable as David Rockefeller did? Who will take his place in assigning tasks to his former private detective agency, the CIA? Who will decide the global issues that he did and force unified action to implement those decisions? Brzezinski? Blumenthal? Brown? Schlesinger? It is in the nature of people to form their own opinions about things if they are not forced to accept and implement certain policies. And so think of the free-for-all that will soon start developing behind the scenes on all sides. Within the industrial community, for example, honest differences of opinion will start cropping up as to how to handle new situations as they arise. Without David Rockefeller to act as arbitrator, these differences will not just go away. Industrial leaders will begin to break up into factions built around different policies, but no faction will be able to impose its will on all the others as David Rockefeller did. And so inevitably that phenomenon which John D. Rockefeller, Sr. denounced as a sin, quote, unquote, will begin to rear its battered head. It's called competition. If we can avoid the suicidal disaster of Nuclear War I, the same thing will also begin happening in all other areas of life in banking, in business, in politics, even in religion, a new freedom of independent thought may yet be reborn if war can be prevented between Russia and the United States. Soon the inevitable internal conflict here in the United States will be getting underway. On one side there are the corporate socialists of the now headless Rockefeller cartel. On the other side there are the Bolshevik state socialists who are now in control of the United States Government. Right now the Rockefeller Corporate Socialist Empire is still more powerful than the United States Government. If they wake up in time they could put a stop to the Bolshevik plan which is now directed at them. And if the people also awaken, then the inevitable rebirth of competitive enterprise could lead gradually to a new era of freedom and prosperity in the West. By breaking their silence about recent events, the fourth generation Rockefellers could help bring about this turn of events. As the conflict builds up between the corporate socialists and the Bolsheviks, Jimmy Carter will be caught in the middle. Already he is racked by leukemia and by cancer in his head, in his intestines, and now in his lungs and bladder. If he does not die first, watch for him to flee from the Presidency under these pressures. When that happens, my friends, you will be faced with a choice which you cannot avoid. Carter's hasty departure from the Presidency will be the first public sign that the rout of the Bolsheviks is beginning here in America. At that point you must decide to do one of two things, to act or not to act. If you decide to act to help save America from the Bolshevik nightmare, you will be choosing freedom, life, and the survival of Christianity. But if you decide to step back and do nothing, you will be casting your vote for Bolshevik control over America. And if you do that, you will be choosing slavery, death, and the satanic hell of Bolshevism. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.